Good morning to all of you joining us for the Friends meeting. This is a, a technological marvel. I think the first Friends meeting by Zoom. So thank, thank you for joining. Uh, we want a presentation for you, uh, but before we get to that, uh, I'm just going to share. So the Red Mill, uh, we're, we're doing okay despite closures through most of the year, and uh, we're back and active. Uh, we have things planned for most every weekend. This past weekend, we just finished up our British Car Day. Phenomenal event, over 100 cars. Uh, our attendance was uh, the same as previous few years, so people are coming out. Uh, we also had a Wheels for the Wheel car show in July. We had a phenomenal concert series on Saturday nights. Well over 100 people each time, each week, uh, and, and phenomenal support uh, donations because we were running those uh, donation only, no admission. This Saturday, we continue that concert series, and, and it's the final installment of it. It runs all day from 11.30 till about 8 o'clock at night. Again, donation only. Uh, people have been very generous. Uh, we have six performances throughout the day. We have High Rail Brewing and Iron Bound Hard Cider and a phenomenal barbecue truck that'll be here on site. Uh, October 4th, we have a quilt airing, uh, which we're happy to have back here at the Red Mill. Uh, we're not doing our haunted, so we're looking for uh, events and hosting various events throughout the fall. So. Uh, October 4th, join us for that quilt airing from 12 to 4, uh, with a rain date of the 11th. We're planning a virtual haunted event that will uh, take a small portion of and replace our actual haunted event. Um, we're also booking weddings. We have two weddings booked. Uh, so we're, we're staying active and busy. We are going to have our winter village, as we had had in the past. It'll be a little bit different. And we're also having our festival of trees. So for those of you who have decorated trees in the past, it's going to be a little bit different. We prefer the decorations are weather resistant, so we're going to have some outside. If you want to do a tree that's indoors, we'll have them inside windows of the various buildings. It'll be an outside event uh, touring. So exciting things. Uh, reach out to me. I, I miss seeing many of you here on site, so uh, feel free to reach out and ask questions about these events, and I look forward to uh, interacting and seeing you. I put everybody on uh, Zoom uh, on mute right now. But if you have a, an iPad or a computer, um, you can unmute yourself. So on the iPad, you touch the screen, go to the menu, and you can unmute. Um, if you're on your laptop, you have to do that with a mouse. You go to, um, you'll see participants, and then you'll see three little dots to the right of that. You can pull, uh, click on the participants and see your name, and you can unmute that way. If you have a touchpad, you can just touch the screen. You'll see a little microphone pop up, and you can touch that microphone, you'll unmute yourself. So we have a wonderful presentation from Pam Molnar today. And Pam will uh, explain her, her topic of dementia, uh, and she's taking questions at the end. So that's when you would uh, unmute yourself and ask those questions. So uh, I'm looking forward to it, and we're very fortunate to have Pam with us today. So enjoy. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> uh, just a little housekeeping. Mer uh, Maggie will run a small meeting after um, my presentation, so stick around. Don't, don't log off. Okay, I'm Pam Molnar. I'm a former or retired geriatric nurse. I had about 30, 33 years as a geriatric nurse under my belt. I've um, done everything been beat from being a medication nurse to an evening supervisor in a nursing home to running an adult daycare center, um, keeping people as engaged and active as long as possible, people who suffer from dementia. Also, um, I run a caregiver support group through the Alzheimer's Association to help caregivers cope with the um, challenges of caring for somebody with dementia. So let's start. Why, why is dementia so frightening? We, as a, particularly in the United States, fear it almost more than any other diagnosis probably because it's the fear of the unknown, but it's mostly the fear of losing control. So part, most of my presentation today is gonna to be focused on how to forestall or keep your mind going so you don't succumb to dementias um, or delay it as long as possible. There's a lot of easy, fun things that you can do as well as nuts and bolts things like diet, exercise, those sorts of things. But I, I do believe that um, few words scare most people more than dementia. But what exactly, what exactly is dementia? Is it just losing your mind? Well, for some of that's a short walk. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> but um, honestly, dementia is a problem with thinking, 
and with memory that impairs daily function. That's a very, very simple definition of a very huge problem. In other words, the person is no longer able to take care of themselves or remember the people in their environment sometimes or what's expected of them. Um, I feel the easiest way to describe dementia is to describe what is normal. Not so much what's abnormal, but what is normal. Forgetfulness happens to all of us and normalcy, what's normal is different for every one of us. I might be, and I am, horrible at math. Nora, you might be wonderful at math. Um, if I can't balance my checkbook, no big deal, I probably can't today, <laughs> you know, if, if you put a gun to my head. But if Nora, who's really good at math, all of a sudden can't balance her checkbook, that, that shows us a problem. That's something that she's always been able to do that she can no longer do. We've all experienced that forgetfulness that's sort of like dementia or very much like some of the symptoms. You walk into the kitchen. Why am I here? I came in here. I know I had something to do. What was it? Or you run into somebody in the supermarket or on the street and they're out of context and you don't know who they are. Who is that? Who is it? That happens to everybody. I can remember my daughters saw their dentist in Walmart many years ago, had no idea who he was. They're going, is he a relative? Is he, who is that person? <laughs> because they saw him out of context. They could not, but, but it was scary in the moment because they knew they should know him. These kinds of things happen to everybody and they're very inconvenient, but you'll eventually remember. You'll remember when you don't have the chicken on the counter that you came into the kitchen to defrost. It's not there, that's inconvenient. You have to figure out something else for dinner, but it's not dementia. It's an inconvenience where your memory is a little bit on overload. Part of the focus of this presentation is, is to teach you little coping skills for that, but I wanna kind of do an overview first, so bear with me. If we look at our brains as a big file cabinet and we have a file clerk at the helm, the file clerk is gonna take all the information and experiences of a day or a lifetime and figure out where to put them. As a baby, it's that person is my mama and that person is safe or that person is scary. I don't know that person. And all these things get put, like every experience that the, the stove is hot, that might be from touching it, that gets put in an area of the brain that you know, <laughs> this is really important to remember and it's right at the forefront so that a child learns very quickly not to touch the stove. But as we age, we've got huge mounds of information. We have the information from when we were children, when we from young adults, what we did in the morning, what we had for breakfast, what we were gonna do tonight. All those things have to be accessed at a time when your file clerk is getting really tired. It's, it's just a lot of information, information overload. Eventually that file clerk can find almost everything. It might maybe the, running into your neighbor on the street corner, hits you in the middle of the night or quite late. Oh, that's Sue, my neighbor's daughter. She's home from college. All of a sudden it clicks where exactly you know that person. That's normal for us to not be able to access every piece of information. It's when you have a hole in your file cabinet that information is lost. The file clerk can't take it and, and put it where it's supposed to be so that you can access it later because either by disease process or whatever, a stroke, things like that, some kind of mechanical failure, all that information falls through. 
you can't find what's not there and it's no longer there. A true problem exists, again, if there's a hole in that file cabinet. Um, information becomes inaccessible. It's not there anymore. It's not just that, oh, I'll remember it eventually, or if I put a string around my finger, I'll remember. It's gone. You won't, somebody with dementia might not realize, remember why a string was put around their finger. It's, it's like all of that is gone. So we're gonna talk about some of the things that we can do that will help us in our day-to-day -day life. Um, one tip that, that I always like to tell people is when, say you, you wanna, um, I don't know, go to the kitchen to take chicken out of the freezer for dinner later today and you're in your laundry room, when it occurs to you, I've got to take something out. So as you're walking to, we've all experienced this, right? Where you get into that kitchen and you don't know. If you're in your laundry room and you're walking into the kitchen, say, I'm taking meat out of the freezer for dinner. If you say it out loud, you form the thought, you are expressing it in words, and you're hearing it. So when you say, do that, you've got three stimulations. And I promise you, if you say that out loud, you'll remember. You're helping your overstressed file clerk. That doesn't mean you have to walk around all day saying, I have to wash my hands, I have to take my mask. But you could say, my mask, as you're putting it in your purse because you know you're leaving in a little while. Things like that that just kind of um, help your overworked file clerk figure out what it is and remember what those things are that you have to do. Most all of us know someone with or will know someone with dementia. It will impact you in some way, shape, or form. It could be a, um, a spouse. It could be a family friend. It could be a sibling. Um, and that's because at last count, there's well over 60 different kinds of dementia. Um, the last time I actually counted them, but this was going back a little bit, there were 64 with variations of each. So it's not important that we go through each kind. I'm just going to kind of give a really simple brief overview of a couple that are, Alzheimer's, which all of us recognize that name. Um, there are many variations of Alzheimer's. There's early onset that hits a person before age 60 or 65. There's late onset, which is the one that we're most um, familiar with. We know, um, we generally think of that as a dementia of aging people, elderly people, people in their, you know, upper 80s or 90s. Um, I should point out that Getting a dementia is not a normal function of aging. It's a disease process, and part of what we want to do is learn how we can avoid these things. Um, and I bring up Alzheimer's because I'm not a thousand years old, I'm 66. And when in my first one of my first jobs in nursing back in uh, probably 1977, I was a medication nurse in a nursing home in New Providence, New Jersey. And I remember an admission was coming in that night. I opened up the, the chart and I looked and it said the diagnosis was Alzheimer's disease. And before the director of nurses left, I ran in and I said, what's Alzheimer's disease? Mm -hmm. Now here I am a geriatric nurse and I'd never heard of it. Now most children know what Alzheimer's disease is now. And that is not because the incidence is necessarily higher, but we recognize it, we learn about it. So that's good and bad, but I'm just, I bring that up because we've come a long way in 30 some years, a long way, with understanding dementias, with treatments, with um, just 
knowing that there are all different kinds. The, the second most um, prevalent form of dementia is vascular dementia. And that um, could be a, a major stroke, could be a bunch of little minor strokes, little infarcts in the brain or in the carotid arteries that interrupt blood flow, flow and affect memory. Um, and I, I just talk about these two because in Alzheimer's, we have a slow, steady decline. The person doesn't learn new things. The person is, is in a state of decline. Where in vascular dementia, the person plateaus, has an event where their memory is uh, impacted, and then they plateau, sometimes for years, sometimes just until another event happens. And then they go down a little and plateau. So they, it's important, very, very important, that we get diagnoses because the treatment is different. And most all dementias, not all of them, but most all dementias are multi-system. So things like uncontrolled diabetes impacts them or high blood pressure or hyper hypercholesterolemia, which just means lots of cholesterol, <laughs> okay, <laughs> either through diet or some people's livers are just really good at making cholesterol. Um, so, so knowing those things can help a physician help you avoid just the mechanical parts of those. Um, and this is just one more little housekeeping event or, or information that you need to know before we talk about how we can avoid these things. And that's a condition called MCI, Mild Cognitive Impairment. And virtually all dementias are heralded by MCI. Um, mild cognitive impairment is a decline in memory and thinking that you still have normal function. In other words, you can still, <coughs> excuse me, you can still manage to get yourself dressed, do the things you need to do to get through the day, but it takes longer and a lot more effort to do that. And generally, um, somebody who knows you well, like a child or a spouse or a, a close relative will notice that something big has changed with you. And at this stage, a lot of people, um, I don't know, I don't think it's stubbornness, I think it's fear, resist talking to their physician. But this is the time that it's most important. When somebody you know says, something's not right, you're having much more difficulty than you used to have, run. Don't walk to your doctor and bring this up to him or her because this is the stage when we're most likely going to have a positive impact on whatever condition is, is causing this, this change. You can get um, drugs for uncontrolled hypertension, which is really gonna help you. You can, if you have mild to moderate diabetes that isn't controlled, we wanna get that under good control because diabetes affects your vascular system. Vascular dementia is the second leading cause of dementia in this country, but vascular problems can also impact Alzheimer's disease in a negative way. So we really, you know, that's something that, as scary as it is, get to your doctor and talk about it. And if you don't get a good response from your doctor, find one who will listen to you. Because this is, this is probably the most least understood part of dementia, that early intervention impacts these disease processes in such a positive way. It really does. And slows the progression by many months to years if you in fact do have, um, are at high risk. So the first thing that you can do to help yourself not succumb to dementia and keep that is exercise, that E word. Um, some of us love it, some of us hate it, 
But take your baseline. If you're normally a fairly sed sed uh, sedentary, excuse me, person, you want to increase your activity and try and get your heart rate moving. And that doesn't mean if you have problems with gait, you can't walk well, or you're, you're frightened and un, um, unsteady on your feet. You can do chair exercises, and, and anything, even if you're able and willing to do stairs. That helps get your heart rate moving, and you slowly increase activity till you're, you know, start out with 10 minutes a day, and make your goal be up to 30 every day. Not that you have your heart pounding, but if you're walking with a friend, even if it's across the street because we're maintaining social distance, we want to um, get our heart rate moving so that when we're walking, we can still have a conversation, but it's a little bit difficult to have a full-blown conversation with the person you're walking with. That's your good indicator. And if you really are struggling, slow down, take it slowly, and increase incrementally by minutes. A day. If you can do eight minutes, by the end of the week, try and do 10. Even increasing by two minutes at a time is going to impact you positively. Um, I try little things like parking at the other end of the, of the supermarket and walking in um, to increase my activity. Um, you know, I know walking is probably the best exercise for people in many of our age categories but it's not good for everyone because of other, other issues. So you need to find what works for you. Just make it low impact and don't overdo. Diet. We've probably all heard about the Mediterranean diet. It's a diet um, based on the Mediterranean region in um, like Italy, Spain, those areas, France. Mediterranean um, has uses olive oil as their essential fat. And that's really good because it cuts down inflammation in the body and inflammation is a huge indicator for problems with um, blood vessel issues, which then can lead to dementia or lead to heart disease. So add olive oil to your diet and, and get rid of as much butter as you can. They're not saying that you can't use butter or animal fat at all, but it should be very much at a minimum. Um, leafy greens, those are really important. Um, lower your animal protein. Try and have um, a couple of meatless meals a week, if possible, where you might use um, cheese like feta, but again, use that as a condiment, or beans, um, chickpeas, things like that, your nut butters that um, a lot of people are, are using it as, a, uh, as the protein source, that's a good thing. Try and have uh, fish twice a week, that can be tuna at lunch, you know, if you, you prefer not to have a tuna steak at dinner, but at least twice a week to have um, fish. One thing that I'm really good at is this next one, sleep. <laughs> we need to have between seven and a half and nine hours a night or a day. Why are you laughing? Is that too much? <laughs> and why is that? I just don't ever sleep that much. You, have you ever? Oh, yeah. Okay. Is it because you wake up or is it because you just don't go to bed in time? <laughs> but it isn't wasted time. It really isn't. That's, I'm glad you said that because that's um, a lot of people, especially more type A personalities, okay, and, and that would be you, um, tend to say, oh, sleep is wasteful. But it's not. That's when your body clears the plaque out of your body. That's when it clears cholesterol. A lot of the, the um, antioxidants and things that happen in your body during the day as you go through your, your daily functions get cleared with sleep. That's when your body does it. So look at it as housekeeping. <laughs> it's extremely important. Seriously, it's really, really important. Um, 
if, if you're interested, there are a couple of books about sleep. There's one called Why We Sleep. And it, uh, I can't remember the author, but I can get that for you. It was a really good book on the importance of uninterrupted sleep and what it does for the body. And, and that's like the new thing in medicine, making sure that people are taking sleep really seriously and, and allowing their bodies to heal at night. Alcohol, moderate use. We know that the American um, Medical Association now says one glass of wine for women and up to two for men. Um, that that's any alcohol if you're uh, per, day. per day per day <laughs> yeah per day that doesn't mean if you don't drink you need to run out and get a bottle but it is telling you that if you are um, someone who enjoys having um, alcohol to limit your intake because too much can cause more problems it could cause just in this context memory loss actually so we want to you know think about that. Hydration. You know, when I was working in adult daycare, I used to explain to my, my clients all the time that besides air, oxygen, water is the most essential for human development, as everybody grabs their glass and starts. I love it. But the first sign of dehydration is that you have a little bit of difficulty expressing yourself verbally. So if you're on the cusp of having a difficulty, hydration, proper hydration, may be the, one of the best things you can do for yourself. When you think about it, everything that happens in the body, every single chemical reaction takes place in water. And we tend to not want want to drink especially as we get older because what's the first thing you think about if you have a big glass of water where's the restroom mm -hmm. right yeah. where's the restroom how am i going to find that is there one at the store i'm going to is that well the truth is that's true for the first two weeks when you increase hydration you have to avoid much more frequently but after two weeks, your body says, okay, I get it, and learns to store urine for longer periods so that when you do find that restroom, you'll avoid more, but not be like, I have to get there, I have to get there. Your body adjusts, it's really good at doing that. So just bear, now's a good time when we're kind of stuck inside, we can't go to these big, you know, many events. We're kind of looking. This is a good time to practice good hydration. What do you think, Maggie? Do brain games help? No, probably not. They don't. They, that's a really good. A lot of people go, oh, yes, yes, I do my Sudoku. Well, you get really good at Sudoku is what happens. Things like crossword puzzles, they're not bad. They, because you're thinking, you know, the clues in crossword puzzles are often, especially on the, you know, say the New York Times crossword, you might have to make an analogy or you might have to think of something that you're thinking out of the box to get that clue. So that's positive. That helps your brain. There's a term that a lot of you have probably heard of or maybe not. It's called neuroplasticity. And what that means is the brain is almost like plastic. It can, it can bend and shape depending on your need. If you have, say something fairly devastating, like a stroke, okay? You have some kind of interruption in blood flow and nerve pathways, but within a year, we know that a person takes a year for their brain to readjust and make new neural pathways, if possible, and also very likely to recover. Unless the, sto the stroke is huge, your body will make new neural pathways. Our um, goal is to figure out how to access those when you haven't had a devastating injury, when you're kind of at the stage where many of us are right now, wanting to forestall dementia. So what are some of the things that we can do? Learn a new skill. 
a lot of people um, found that doing things like learning a new language helps. That's a, a pretty hefty undertaking. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that you have, your goal has to be to be fluent. I was trying a while ago, I have a, a young friend who lives in um, Uganda, and he was trying to teach me Swahili, un unbelievably, over the you know text. <laughs> Didn't go so well, um, mostly because Suna was not a really great teacher. He was a one, he's a wonderful guy, but he would just come up with these things and then start putting paragraphs in Swahili that I had no idea what he was talking about. But I learned some words, and I did learn that the Lion King, Akuna Matata, is really, um, it's okay, nothing to worry about. It really means the thing that it did in the Lion King. <laughs> and most of those words, most of the uh, words that they use are actually um, based in fact. That is, true Swahili names. Um, have any of you, well, heard of the Nun study? Yes. The Nun study, um, I think it was a 20 year long study where um, researchers followed a group of cloistered nuns. So these were nuns that were, <coughs> had taken a vow of silence and that were in a um, convent that didn't have a lot of impact, a lot of um, exposure to the outside world at all. So it's a really great controlled group. Their diets were all very, very similar. Their um, exposure to one another or their, um, uh, I just lost the word. Their um, stimulation, thank you, Nora, that's the word. Their stimulation was very similar. And they found that, I, I should say that most of these nuns also were theological scholars. They did a lot of things with scripture, both um, research and, and a lot of um, comparison, a lot of looking into what everything meant. So they were more intellectualized than the normal population. And what they found was at death, they were all autopsied. And many of the nuns were riddled with plaques and tangles of Alzheimer's disease, but had no known effect. And that's because in the cloister, not only were they intellectually stimulated, but they changed jobs all the time. So you might do scripture from the Old Testament, and then your superior would say, you did a really good job on that. I want you to switch to the New Testament, and you do the Old Testament. Um, you're the cook, but we're going to give this nun a chance to do cooking. So jobs would change, so stimulation changed, so it wasn't always the same thing. Because when we always do the same thing, we're not intellectually stimulated. I can tell you one of the, some mm -hmm. of the things that I've done in my life to help my brain stay active, particularly at retirement, because that's when a lot of us see, you know, a down tick in what we do to keep our, you know, intellect. I learned how to wheeze. It was something I always wanted to do, but I was always kind of afraid of it because I am no math genius, and I was convinced that this was going to take a type of math that I would not be able to, that, that I would find frustrating. Well, guess what? There are tables to help you. <laughs> there are all kinds of things, and there's not a whole lot of math involved. Um, so, so I learned how to weave, and I've woven um, for a few years now. And the thing with weaving is that you can constantly um, go farther. You can do more complicated patterns. You can do um, less complicated patterns. You can... Um, and it's very zen when you're, you're weaving, particularly if you're just doing plain weave and you're not following this intricate pattern, you're lost in that. You learn, you take a break, your brain gets a, um, a rest in a way that, that most other activities do not um, provide. 
So that's, that's one of the things that I did. I also started um, reading nonfiction, which is something that I'm not. I love to read. I'm an avid reader. I can easily read three books a week without breaking a sweat. But I was, I'm always, I like novels. I like to go away. I like to be, <laughs> um, but if you read nonfiction, it's a different mm -hmm. skill of reading. And I have a, I'm in a fabulous book club that, I mean, I wouldn't quit this book club even if I hated absolutely everything we read because they're such great people. And pre-COVID-19, we met, you know, after reading books and it was just fabulous. Laura, Nora, you know you're in that book club. It's a great book. Great book club. Um, as I mentioned, I, I flirted briefly with Swahili, but that did not go well. <laughs> um, art projects. I like, I like art, and I'm not particularly a wonderful artist, but I like to try different things. So there for a while, I was in a group. There were four of us. It started out with four, and as lives change, um, it wound up being two of us, and then my friend Lorraine, who we did it for a couple of years together, she she moved to um, Philly, so it kind of disbanded. But what we do is every month we pick an art project out of a book I have. It's called 365 Days of Art, and it might be something as simple as work in orange to um, create something with circles or use salt in your art project, or whatever. And everybody would interpret it in different ways. It was so fun. And I mean, I, I made some really great stuff. I did a, um, a wind chime that was uh, spoons that we cut the end off the spoon and then bent them, made the, put a little hole in them, made them look like fish and then hung them um, from a big piece of driftwood. And I have it hanging in my weaving studio and I just love it. And it, you look back and you think, how fun was that? Learning how to do all that stuff. And so, you know, it's something that I recommend and it does, it's for you. So it doesn't, who cares if it tanks? Who cares if it tanks? You're, you're out a little bit of, you know, stuff and you'll learn a lot. Sometimes you'll learn more from things that tank than you do from things that go well. Um, some of you might remember when your children were going to, getting ready to go to kindergarten. It, it always seemed, until I understood it, kind of ridiculous. Why are they making these kids skip? And why do they have to climb those steps? What does that have to do with kindergarten? Well, those are reading readiness skills. If you can skip, you learn. You can learn to read, and you're ready to learn to read because you're crossing that midline, the median in the in the body. Your left and right brain have to learn to communicate back and forth. You can climb a step or a ladder. One, two, three. Your left, right, left, right. Those are the kind of things that we want to do as we age, not climb ladders and skip, <laughs> but maybe when you're brushing your teeth, if you're right-handed, use your left hand. When you do that, it's not easy. It's not easy. And, and you want to really get in there and really brush your teeth and really try and do it because your brain is, that neuroplasticity comes into play. It's trying to do something different that's going to make your, your brain use both left and right side. Close your eyes and button your blouse. It sounds ridiculous, but you, you'd be surprised how much that, especially when you're standing, mm -hmm. you have to maintain balance. So if you have balance issues, stand with your body against, say, the um, sink in your bathroom so that you have a little bit of stability. And, you, and also, don't be afraid to open your eyes if you become um, unsteady. But it's, it's something you can do that really, honest, honest to God, really helps you, your, your brain, to learn you know, how to go from right to left and left to right. Another thing that you can do is if you're driving to the red mill 
and you always come a certain way, come another way. Take a different route. That doesn't mean go five, five miles out of your way. But instead of, say you're walking, take, you're taking a walk around your block, and you always start at the left and go around, go the right way. And when you do that, when you go in an opposite direction, you're seeing the world through different set of eyes, right? Or your same eyes, but you're seeing it differently because what's normally at your back is at your forefront now. It's really good for you to do that. It really, really small things that have a big impact on brain health. Um, avoid meds. This is really important. It's something that, that bothers me a lot. Benadryl. Benadryl is a drug that's, that's used for allergies. But it had, one of its uh, side effects is that it makes you sleep. So things like Tylenol PM, Advil PM, all of them, they're just Advil with diphenhydramine or Benadryl in it. And they're marketed for people, um, generally premenopausal women, 40-ish, 40, 45, 50 year olds. That's what they're marketed at. That, that's the group, that's the target group. That's the worst thing you can do for yourself because this particular drug is called an anticholinergenic. Doesn't mean you have to remember that, it just means you stay away from Benadryl unless you have an allergy. What that drug does is interrupts the nerve synapse, that's where from one nerve to the next, that chemical reaction, it stops it. It basically kind of gives you a mild case of myasthenia gravis for a short period of time while that's in your bloodstream. And if you take it frequently, it can really impact uh, memory at a time um, during menopause, especially when women are really struggling with memory issues because of the hormone changes. So avoid those things and avoid them for the rest of your life unless you have allergy issues and it's life-threatening, of course, you can take a Benadryl. One of my daughters uh, was taking it, taking Benadryl to sleep because she was having difficulty sleeping. And I'm like, no, 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 please don't do that. Find something else, get yourself some valerian <laughs> or, you know, di different, um, and just figure out why you're not sleeping, okay. Um, anything that assists your file clerk is a positive. I am a big list maker, and I find lists wonderfully satisfying. Crossing those things off that list, even if it's get dressed, you know, wow, that's one down. You know, it's very, very empowering to have a, a long list of little things and, and cross them off. But it also frees up your mind to not, um, that's okay, I got it. I dropped my glasses. Got it. Frees up your brain to do other things. And, and don't look at it as a crutch, it's a help. You have an overworked file clerk help that, that poor little guy out. Um, put things, one of the thing I, things I do, if I have to remember to take something with me that's not, um, you know, maybe it's in the refrigerator that I wanna take it, so I can't leave it out. I put something out of place. I might put something blocking the door I leave from. I have been known to take like a dishcloth and throw it over the steering wheel in my car so that when I see it, I know, oh, I gotta go get whatever's in there. Something, think of a coping skill that will work for you. Everybody's a little bit different, but one thing I found is putting something out of place, um, blocking the door. You know, I put my grocery bags, my um, reusable go grocery bags on the, uh, like you can't open the door without hitting it. I've left them there a couple times, I must admit, but most days we remember. And in the car, I try and put the grocery bags on the front seat next to me so I don't forget to take them in with me, because that's another thing. They're only as good as, as uh... so we're going to say things out loud. We talked about that before, where you walk into your, your kitchen and you're going to get that chicken out. Um, one thing for medications, if you take a medication, say in the morning and the evening, when you take it in the morning, turn the bottle upside down. When you see it upside down, you've known you've taken it in the morning, and in the evening, 
turn it right side up so it's ready for the morning. So that's one thing that can really um, help you. If you take multiple medications, get those little med boxes that you can buy. They're little rectangular med boxes. Great. This one has Monday through the whole week. The whole week. So I haven't seen the round ones. Um, I've seen the, the, the long skinny ones that have, you know, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And if you do those, you can put your morning in one color and your evening in another. And you can take them with you. The whole week. The day. Very good. Oh, that's a, that's a nice one. I'll send you a link on that would be good. <laughs> They're awesome. <laughs> um, oh, listening to classical music. My husband Mike will be happy to hear this because he, he enjoys classical music. And I kind of don't. But um, I, I'm more of a 60s and 70s rock girl <laughs> myself. But um, classical music, because it's so multifaceted, it really is very stimulating to your brain, especially if you're relaxing and you're listening to it and you do things like trying to pick out the strings so that you know they're in the forefront or trying to pick out the woodwinds or trying to pick out the, the brass. It's very good for you. It's very good for your brain. It's again, a stimulation that's different that you don't always do. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if you, expect, if you suspect an issue, please reach out. You can talk to your doctor. You can get recommendations for where to turn from the um, Alzheimer's Association. In um, New Jersey, it's called Alzheimer's of New Jersey. They split from the national organization a few years ago, but they are a wellspring of information. Uh, they won't necessarily recommend a specific doctor, but they'll give you a list of practitioners in your area that specialized in whatever you need. Um, early intervention um, and proper diagnosis really honestly can truly help. Rule out other, other conditions. Um, many years ago now, I guess, well many, 10, 10, 12 years ago, I had really bad Lyme's disease. And I knew I had a problem. I knew I had bad joints and I had, you know, some issues. But at the time, I was the director of an adult daycare center and made my, you know, my job was talking. Something I'm pretty well, <laughs> I like to talk. But I would be in front of the group. And, and one of the things I did with the group was current events. We talk about something and just because I wanted to treat adult people like adult people. So I would talk about maybe nutrition or maybe something in, in the newspaper. And I would be halfway through or maybe three sentences in and lose, totally lose and not be able to get it back. And I ran to my doctor and said, I, I'm, you know, this is really bad. And he got me um, a pick line and I was treated for two months with IV antibiotics and came out of it being able to link a sentence together again. So I really, you know, I was scared. I have a bad family history. My mama had, my mother had Alzheimer's, my father had vascular dementia. I thought it was happening to me. And it turned out it was, you know, a bug. So don't be afraid, find out. Could be Lyme's disease, could be B12 deficiency. There are a lot of um, vitamin deficiencies that can cause um, problems with, with thinking. We're, we're, we are really learning all the time. And um, with learning, we're also learning coping strategies so that people can successfully live. You know, I should tell you one other antidote. Many of you probably know the... Um, uh, country music star, Chris Christopherson. Well, Chris Christopherson um, had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's dementia. And um, my son is a musician and he used to often be part of the South by Southwest Music Festival. So he met Chris 
several times. And we have some lovely pictures with Brian, with Chris Christopherson, and I just think it's wonderful. But Chris was, was one time Brian said to him, oh man, that, that song was great. What did I play? I don't, and he had just come off stage, couldn't remember, and it was really sad. And then a really great neurologist saw Chris and realized, this isn't right. This is not the way this disease progresses. And he tested him. It turns out he had Lyme's disease that had gone undiagnosed. And he was treated with high doses of antibiotic and he's touring again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, terrific. That is a real, um, you know, push, push, push to get the proper tests and the proper diagnosis. Here in Hunterdon County, we have a really good um, geriatric assessment program. And there's one at St. Peter's in, um, that one's called COPSA. The one at um, Hunterdon is at the Center for Healthy Aging. And it's a complex um, group of tests, both verbal, some pencil and paper tests, some um, just anecdotal but you're put through your paces and you come out generally knowing if you really have a problem or if it's something that can be treated. Um, one thing that I can't stress enough, a few years ago, there was a study that said that taking statins, those are drugs for cholesterol, like Lipitor and Crestor, and there's several that they were not good, that they caused dementia. They don't. Every neurologist that, that I know of and everything I'm reading said that it was a very flawed study and that the proof is in the pudding. Take your um, statin drugs, they do not cause dementia. And my, my good friend, Dr. Andrew Budson, who's a neurologist in um, Boston, asked me particularly to stress that because, you know, it's like something comes out and people think, oh, man, I'm not doing that. Trying to advocate for themselves, but this is something you really, if you are diagnosed with high cholesterol and your doctor suggests you take a statin, take that drug, it's really good for you. Um, again, we, we don't want to stop our cholesterol meds. Some of the meds that do... Um, impact memory or things like sleep meds, anxiety meds, cold and flu meds, um, pain meds, muscle relaxant, ra relaxants, incontinence meds. A lot of the drugs that people take when they have um, overactive bladder or men have overactive, uh, or not overactive, but prostate issues, those impact your memory. I mean, maybe there's another way. For women, there's Kegel exercises. Um, there's a lot of different things that you can do that can help that. Besides, don't stop taking any of these meds that you're on without talking to your doctor, but it's worth a conversation if you take certain meds and are experiencing some, some memory issues. Um, probably the best thing you can do is keep your health in as best place as it can be. Do everything you can to support your health and to support, you know, take your meds, keep your blood pressure under control. If you have diabetes, keep it in good control. Do things like stay social, which is a challenge during a pandemic. But there's nothing wrong with that telephone. There's nothing wrong with Zooming. There's nothing wrong with having a video chat with a friend or an acquaintance or a loved one or a family member, even just a phone call. And one thing, a lost art, let's maybe research this art, letter writing. You know, there's nothing more wonderful than getting a friendly letter in the, in the mail, like a card or letter. I do try and write letters because I don't get many, but I like to write them particularly to older relatives or to people that I don't see often. You know, yeah, you can send a text. Yeah, you can make a phone call. But there's nothing like that letter. And you can write it over days. You know, make it real chock full of, of wonderful things. Remember, too, that everybody's different. What's right, right for you is not right for you. 
what's right for me is probably not going to be what's right for Maggie or Nora. We're all different. But you know if there's a change or your family knows. Take that to the bank and go see your doctor and get it diagnosed so that you can intervene. Um, things that are a challenge for you and were when in your younger life, you're not going to get better at now, you know, but things that weren't, you should try and maintain. Um, give yourself and your file clerk a real break and relax. When you can't remember something, when you, you don't know why you went into the kitchen, take a deep breath, say it's not the end of the world. I can't remember. When you relax, you're absolutely more likely to remember than you are if you get stressed by it. And it is what it is. You know, if you can't remember getting angry and frustrated with yourself, I promise you that's not going to help. Um, another thing, I brought rosemary with me, the, the herb. And there's a whole bunch of studies that show that if you rub rosemary to get the oils and inhale it, that sense, it smells wonderful, doesn't it? It, um, it is stimulating. So if you happen to be doing something like myself today, I haven't done anything like a Zoom meeting or any meeting or any talk in a long time. In my car, I was rubbing it, trying to get myself like into it. And it really helps, I think. I think, can't hurt, might help, why not, right? Um, remember, it's not when you can't find your keys. It's when you can't remember what your keys are for. That's real, that was really helpful to me. My mother passed away from Alzheimer's disease, and you know, many of you have lost loved ones. Those weeks and months after, you're kind of in a fog. And I would find myself like thinking about things and just being lost in, in, in you know, maybe forgetting, oh, I have to go pick up my kids at school, you know, and I'm late. Things that normally were at the tip of my tongue and I thought, oh man, I'm losing it, I'm next. And I went to my doctor and that's what he said to me. What are these, Pam? Well, they're my glasses. It's when you don't know to put your glasses on your face so you can read that you have a problem, okay? It's when you don't know what they're for. So give yourself a break and thank you for your time. And I hope some of this has been helpful. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I do it to the applause. Um, Maggie Murphy is going to um, change places with me. Do we want questions? Oh, does anybody have any questions? Thank you. I forgot. <laughs> does anybody have any questions for me? Is there a good, uh, a good book to be on? Oh, Care for caregivers. Oh, for caregivers. The, excuse me? I will. Um, Dana asked if there's a good resource, a good book that can help. There's a couple, but the, the first book that I would recommend everybody read, because it would help you with as a caregiver or even as just for information, is called The 36-Hour Day. Kind of a way of saying that dealing with someone with dementia in particular your day's no longer 24 hours. It's, there's a lot crammed into it. But this book has been, it's readily available. You can get it used on Amazon, I'm sure. Um, they, the 36 hour day is the gold standard for uh, dementia care and, and understanding dementia. There's a couple of books written by my very good friend, Dr. Andrew Budson, B-U-D-S-O-N. And one of them are the step, seven steps to healthy memory. And that's a good resource for anyone who is concerned about what's normal and what's not. And he also has several books that help. Um, he's working on one too for caregivers, um, especially that'll be out very soon. Um, and it's very good. I, um, I'm lucky that I know this man well and he sends me his um, uh, galleys to, to read and just to give input on. So we've become, we learned, met each other professionally and have become really good friends. And he living in Boston will often ask me if I know a good um, doctor in the area to 
refer some somebody because he gets a lot of emails. So that's any questions. Do they have, do you have to take you might have to take your um, Zoom off mute if you have a question. Can we take everybody on? I'm gonna do it now. Okay, does anybody have any questions? How many ounces in a full glass of wine? <laughs> Six. Six Darn ounces. <laughs> and, and one thing that I found is if you put three in one glass and a hefty amount of seltzer, <laughs> you get two big glasses. <laughs> Pam, can Anybody you hear me? Else? Yes, Pam, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, you talk about writing letters. Yes. One of the things that I notice is that my handwriting is getting terrible. And it seems to me somewhere I read that actually handwriting is, that bad handwriting can be a symptom of Alzheimer's. Is that true? Please. I have not heard that. Um, Nancy, I think that um, part of the thing with, with handwriting degrading is arthritic changes. The fact that we don't write a lot, um, we, it's a skill that we don't use the way we did even 20 years ago. We use our thumbs <laughs> and, uh, on um, phones or we use the keyboard on a uh, computer. So I wouldn't let that be concerning, um, honestly, unless you see many other symptoms. Uh, and if your, your children are telling you that you, they see changes. Um, I would not worry about one specific symptom. I know that they say that uh, inability to smell or, or to recognize smells. And I did, I went through a period where I was having trouble um, I could smell, but I didn't know what it was. And I happened to mention it to Dr. Butts. Excuse me? Um, he said there's about 100,000 different reasons that it had happened. And as it turned out, I think I just had um, the tail end of a cold. And it just, you know, you go right to the work. That's, you know, a little knowledge is dangerous. So, Nancy, did that answer your question? It did, and I do use the keyboard a great deal, so that might be the issue. Thank you. It probably is, and, and it's for all of us. I mean, we don't write the way we did, you know, 20, 25 years ago. Anybody else? I have a question. Yes. I, I've had, over my lifetime, six concussions. The last one was several years ago but it has increased my sense of smell a great deal. I'm just wondering if these various concussions are leading me to a lousy conclusion. <laughs> well, I mean, it's certainly not something that we want to say, oh, cool, I, I've had six concussions. Um, <laughs> it does increase your risk for, um, you know, it, it's a traumatic brain injury. What I would do, though, is stay um, in touch with your physician oh, yeah. and anything that you might notice, bring to their attention. Um, it seems like you're pretty much on the ball. I um, wouldn't overthink it. I think it's, a, it, it's another indicator of risk, but it's not the be-all, end-all. Mm -hmm. So just um, relax about it, but discuss any kind of um, concerns you have with with a physician, and if you'd feel better, be followed by a neurologist. That's I always. Am. Good. I no. am. Okay. Good. And my well, handwriting also is going downhill. Yeah. Well, if you write a lot. Probably no. not. No. That's I know. Yeah. Okay. Good luck to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the muscles change. Oh, it's a lot of different things. <clears throat> Does anyone else have? Okay, very good. It's Maggie's gonna. Uh, no, leave, 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 leave them unmuted. Okay, Maggie's gonna talk to us for a minute and have a great day. Don't trip over my house. Don't trip over your back. That's true. Okay, hi. 
Here I am. Pam, did you see yourself in the, in the little thing in the corner? Yeah. Okay. That was All right. Uh, I'd like to thank, thank Pam for a great presentation. She does such a good job. She really is a good presenter and um, very informative. And uh, thanks a lot for, uh, for that, Pam. I would also like to thank Paul because he really has gotten us uh, on board with this and uh, has been really helpful. And I have to say, I was very nervous um, this morning. Uh, and, and actually, I did sleep last night, but I'm not so sure why I was able to. So Paul, thank you very much for, um, for that. Um, some really sad news in case uh, all of you don't know, uh, Ari Van Arsdale died uh, late last week. Um, she has requested that there be no um, funeral, uh, and we are going to be in touch with her son, Jim, to find out uh, where he would put donations, if that is the case. And we will get you Jim's address um, so you can send a sympathy card to Jim and um, his wife, Becky, and his sister, um, Luann. And Ari, of course, force of nature, uh, in general, and also at the mill, and uh, she was a fixture in the shop, and she's the person who got me involved uh, in the Friends, so, uh, and in the mill, so I have to thank for that, so she definitely will be missed, um, for sure. Um, the secretary's report, um, Nora was sailing on the Nile, uh, and that's when we had Dana, who was right here, Dana Bella, do Dress to Kill at Chai Time. And that was our last real um, outing. Uh, and I, I looked at the my notes and we were talking about the luncheon and we were talking about the trip to Philadelphia. And of course, none of that has happened. Um, the Treasures Report, Sharon can't be with us on Zoom. Uh, we have $3,504 in the Treasury, and that's after we donated $2,000 to the mill in July. Uh, dues are due. Send uh, them to the Friends of the Red Mill at the mill, uh, Sharon. Lynn, do you want to say a few words on communications? Uh, am I, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, when you send your dues, I think it would be smart if you put your address and your email and your phone number. We're trying to update the book and fix mistakes that I've probably done in the past. So that would be good. Good. But can I keep talking? Yes, go ahead. Uh, more exciting is going to be October 8th, our next it's going to be a meeting at the mill. I think everyone had an email about it. Today, there's actually going to be a mill, uh, a little meeting at my house with some of the old timers from the mill. And we're going to have a lot of fun show and tell and stories and pictures from the old days at the mill. Uh, it's going to be socially okay. Bring your chair, bring something to drink, sit far away from everybody. And maybe we need a microphone so we can... I'm hoping a lot of people come and they'll have trouble hearing if we don't have a microphone. So we have to think about that. <laughs> anyway, other than that, uh, everything's fine as far as I know. Okay, great. That Thank was you. was wonderful. What time? Good, good. It's going to be 10 o'clock. If it's a rainy day, then it will have to be on the night. If that's a rainy day, we'll figure it out. We will figure it out. Okay. Um, after that, we are going to, we are trying to plan a trip to the Lebanon Museum with, uh, with Gina. It will be an outdoor uh, event. It will not be the same as, the, as it's described in the um, handbook because um, we don't want to be indoors. Uh, but they have a facility that is, uh, it's covered over, but it is exposed to the outside. So it would be, it'll be kind of like being um, in a tent, I guess, without, without sides. So it, it should it should be great, and um, she's planning that with us. But she has to get permission from the um, the mayor and, and the town council or committee, whatever they call it. So um, so that's for um, both of those things are, uh, for October. That would be October nineteenth, and then we're going to have a Zoom meeting um, by Paul in November on the sixteenth. The um, the Clinton Irish, 
and we are trying to put together something for December from the collection, and that will also be on Zoom. So we're um, trying to stay in touch with everybody, and um, hopefully you'll be able to come to these things or at least be with us on Zoom. And thanks so much for attending today, those of you who attended. Uh, we will, uh, we are going to be able to, um, or actually we are, um, recording this. And the mill will send out a link to our members and anybody else. So if they weren't able to watch it or be on Zoom, at least they'll be able to, to hear the talk. So, um, so we have two ways of communicating, which, which is really great. So I thank Paul for that too. So if anybody has, is there anything I left out? Anybody? No? Okay. Bye everybody. Thanks for coming.